This is Yesterzine, where we play the highest and lowest rated games from an old gaming magazine and discover whether Father Time got out of bed on the right side this morning. Except today we don't. We've picked two magazines. From Amiga Action 64, published in December 1994, our gaming heaven is robotic beat-em-up Rise of the Robots, picking up an excellent 92%. From Amiga Power 45 in January 1995, our gaming hell is robotic beat-em-up Rise of the Robots, picking up 5%. And it's not just those two. Amiga Joker in Germany gave the A1200 version 90% as well, and awarded 87% to the CD32 version, despite it being identical, minus £10 on the price tag and the need to swap around a bunch of discs. Two things that, being a gruff old traditionalist, I would suggest were theoretically plus points. And before you ask, yeah, same reviewer both times. Amiga User International gave the A500 version 91% in a review that said essentially nothing about the game, only that every possible style of game had already been done, there weren't many of them, and this was a beat-em-up, thus 91%. Given what we now know, I really suspect the uncredited reviewer never played it. It continues, though. Amiga CD32 Gamer gave it 90%, although retracted that a few months later, only to assign it a still respectable 77. CU Amiga flung out 80 and 81% scores for all three versions as well. Meanwhile, joining the 5% Amiga Power gave it was their sister magazine, Amiga Format, who stretched to 19%. And just to be difficult, the one Amiga gave it 59 Although it's worth remembering that The One was a magazine where you pretty much had to launch an airstrike on their office to get below 50. Remember, they managed to give the almost entirely unplayable Spoils of War from our first episode, 48. Something's going on here. Is Rise a 9 or 90% game? Is it still one? What the bloody hell were either Amiga Power or Amiga Action thinking? The game, Dr. YouTubeson, is afoot. So perhaps I should explain Rise. It's a 2D robot fighting game. Because it's the 90s, and robot fighting games are cool. That said, despite the obvious benefits of easier rendering and excuses for poor physics, I can only really think of three. And I'm going to mention both before you finish watching this, so we don't need to cover them now. We should, however, cover Rise's plot, because it's a smidge more involved than your average fighting game. In the year 2043, Electrocorp is the world's largest megacorporation, leading manufacturer and developer of advanced robotics and six-time winner of the Least Imaginative Name for a Future Technology Company award. In fact, they're too big. And having clearly not watched any sci-fi in the last century or so, they decide to automate their operation with a gigantic robotic hive mind. Said hive mind is named the Supervisor, because that sounds suitably foreboding. Once turned on, it learns at an unprecedented rate and quickly becomes the perfect multitasking ultra-intelligent robot, the pinnacle of artificial intelligence and more than capable of managing every aspect of the plant's day-to-day -day operations. Having presumably watched Terminator 2, which incidentally was released around the same time they started developing Rise of the Robots, Electrocorp at least managed to not give the supervisor internet access. Despite this, and of no surprise to anyone who has worked in an office ever, the supervisor still manages to get a virus. I assume because someone, probably called Karen, forwards it an email of random cat pictures. The supervisor begins to develop self-awareness and takes on a humanoid female form because nerds. The supervisor takes control of Electrocorp's facilities and affects the other droids of the plant raising them to break routine and initiate a mutiny. Every human in the place is near instantly killed for being too difficult to animate convincingly on a 16-bit machine. There is one cyborg, unaffected by the virus because it has a human brain cloned from the now-dead CEO. This cyborg, inexplicably called Cotton, sets out to fight the controlled robots in ascending order of difficulty before taking on the supervisor. Cotton realises the most efficient way to do this is of course to punch and kick them until they fall over. And maybe use a special move or two if, Duddle if he can remember the keys. Phew, 
And if you think that's long, you should know that even with my totally non-tedious jokes, that's about half the length of the original. As you might have guessed from our magazine choices, the lead systems for Rise of the Robots were the Amiga 1200 and its red-headed stepsister, the CD32. For this show, we've been playing it almost entirely on a CD32. There's a few reasons for that. Firstly, that it only seems fair to play it on the system it was meant for, and on the system that both Amiga Action and Power reviewed it on. Secondly, that someone should play something on a CD32 at some point, because not very many people did during its short commercial lifetime. But thirdly, and much, much more importantly, it's because the A1200 version of Rise of the Robots came on 13 discs. 13. Each fight is a minimum of two disc swaps. For some reason it seems to always insist on having disc one in for the actual fight, and it's absolutely not averse to making you disc swap after a fight just to load a picture of your defeated foe. The best part though is that rendered intro you watched at the start of the episode. It has that. To watch that two minute mostly text intro you're going to be making four disc swaps. We know. We tried it. The first disc swap occurs halfway through the second sentence after the three credit screens. The others are not better timed. The small mercy is it does at least support a second drive. This probably also accounts for the A1200 version having what can only be described as a loltastic retail price of £43 in an era where most Amiga games were 25 quid. The CD32 version was almost reasonable by comparison at 35. Rise had a fairly lengthy development period for an Amiga game. You'd expect the very smart Autodesk created 3D Studio sprites to be the main time drain, but that was all done by February 1994, a year after the initial announcement of the game. That was also the originally announced release date, but the game was held back until November in order to enhance the gameplay and perfect the graphics. The developers made much of the robot fighting AI. To explain this, we called the lead programmer, ex-Bitmap brother Sean Griffiths. And after comments such as, why are you ringing me, and it's 2.30am, can't this wait, he offered the following. Rise of the Robots is not a conventional fighting game, and the team are using robots that fight and act unusually, with a very high level of artificial intelligence that has never been seen before. We'll definitely have one over on Street Fighter 2. Which seems a perfect segue into the actual game, because here's what happens if I leave the settings on their defaults, start a game, enter a fight, and simply hold the joypad up and right and the single fire button down. It's not learning a hell of a lot, is it? And this opponent actually does better than several others. Here, for instance, is number two. Enjoy the shadows clipping through his cowering form, by the way. Here's number three. Actually, the hardest opponent in the whole game. You occasionally have to punch him to keep him trapped. This is the only one in the game that'll win if you do just hold up and right. Here's opponent four. And five. At this point, you'd fight those five again, exactly the same rules apply. So here's the end boss, surely she'll put up a challenge. Oh, never mind then. And we've completed the game, here's the credits, where real people admit to having worked on this. I'll forgive Richard Joseph, there's nothing wrong with this music, even if it feels like it was made for a different, much more upbeat game, but everyone else should be ashamed of themselves. In 
investigating further, it seems you can complete the game in the bottom two difficulties by making sure your opponent is trapped on the side and then spamming that move. We'd lost the will to live by this point, but apparently you can even get to the final boss in the third of four difficulty levels as well. It probably won't surprise you to know that the music was also produced with the grand ambition but logistical half-assery that you must be starting to realise is virtually a trademark of this game. Mirage commissioned rock guitarist and walking advert for a Vialida supermop, Brian May, to do a whole soundtrack for the game. And he did indeed do so. Unfortunately, thanks to his record company being roughly as organised as your average pub crawl by 9pm, it wasn't ready remotely on time, even with the lengthy delays to the game. So Amiga music god Richard Joseph stepped in and threw together some perfectly good incidental music, although there's nothing during the actual fights. Brian May is still the lead music credit on the box though, since they still have the licence, and his track The Dark does feature in the game. Sort of. At the risk of putting YouTube's copyright bot in a tiz, here's the entirety of The Dark as it features in the game. Oh, and that wasn't me cutting it off, that was the game. So I think we've established that Rise of the Robots is considerably more the game power thought it was than action. Or whatever the hell was going on at AUI. So the suitable for a cover feature question would be, is there a better robot fighting game from the period? And there might be. Back then I never played Rise of the Robots, but I did play one on PC and I remembered it being very good. So this then is One Must Fall 2097 from Epic Mega Games. Now just a tiny smidge more famous for a little game called Fortnite and the Unreal Engine that powers pretty much bloody everything at this point, including, just for instance, Mass Effect, Borderlands, Batman and even Yoshi's Crafted World. Although here they were merely the publishers for a little project by just four people, released very neatly about halfway between Rise's original release date and when it actually got farted out onto store shelves. Let's start with the music. I listened to The Dark barely longer ago than you did, and I'm not sure I could tell you how it goes. But I was humming One Must Fall's theme tune before the thing had even installed, and I've not played it in 20 years. Listen to it. Fall has a normal fight the opponents in ascending order of difficulty mode, with what in hindsight should be a fairly obvious mechanic for a robot fighting game. You pick your character, known as a pilot, and then you pick their robot. Each has different stats that affect the fight, and if you're in marketing you could argue this gives the game 100 characters. In any case it's more than the one Rise has for its single player. The game itself clears the Rise bar with room to spare as well. There's music, the game moves well, and spamming a single move is never, ever gonna work. The stages still don't scroll, but the game makes use of this by playing to the tournament mechanic and including hazards at the edge of some of the stages, like this electric fence. And sometimes even in the middle, such as the dive bombers in this stage. It's neatly managing hard, but not unfair as well. I'm by no means winning everything, but I'm learning from it and it doesn't feel unfair. I've no idea if it's learning from me, as Rise claimed to, but that in itself means it's doing something right. There's also nice presentation touches like the little bonuses for doing cool stuff, and after matches there's this lovely little news report on the match which is smart enough to use real screenshots from it. If that were the whole thing this would already be the easy recipient of Robot Fighting Game of the Year 1994, but the real meat of OMF is an expansive and very impressive career mode. This time you create your own pilot, such as Ian Robot here. You start with the lowest pilot stats and a Jaguar robot that fell off the back of another slightly better robot. And enter tournaments in order to earn the money to take evening classes to improve your stats, 
and hire a better mechanic to do the same to your robot. Or trade it in for a shinier model. The involvement of money means that suddenly the style is important. Those bonuses we saw earlier for combos now translate directly into extra moolah, as does the amount of health you have remaining. Conversely, that also affects how much you're going to have to pay out to repair the thing afterwards. The news reports even reflect your margin of victory. And losing isn't the end of the world. It'll cost you some money, but not half as much as a win gains you, and so you should still be able to make overall progress through the tournament by gradually buying more upgrades than you have to sell in order to repair yourself. The end of each fight also comes with some excellently nerdy stats about how well you did and how you somehow can't land more than half your punches using a superhuman robot in a small arena. There's so much Rai should have taken from this. If you'd just taken the tournament plot they could still have had their flashy intro and it might actually have given them a better excuse for only having one robot to play the rule to player one. If I ever catch anyone on Rai's development team I'm going to buy them a copy of this just so they can see what they should have done. Which sounds like an expensive gesture, but it really isn't, because here's the best part. One Must Fall has been freeware since 1999. Get yourself a copy of DOSBox, set to around 9000 cycles, a number it took me some time to figure out, and a copy of this, and you can lose an evening easily. And no one has ever lost an evening to Rise of the Robots, unless they were trying to watch that intro on an A1200 with one drive. You can download One Must Fall in many places on the internet, but we recommend excellent fan site omf2097.com slash Robert, where there's also very useful strategy guides and FAQs. So what happened here? Amiga Action was notably more, let's say, enthusiastic than other magazines in general, of course. They were once famous for saying that a game functioning at all should score 35% straight off, for instance. But even they didn't tend to throw out 92s entirely willy-nilly. Cannon fodder only got 1% more as a CD32 re-release in this issue, and the by now rather ancient and pointless Micropro Soccer 15%. Even with their usual score modifier, they wouldn't normally give their Amiga Action Accolade Award for games that you absolutely must buy to anything. Only 4 of the 25 reviews in this issue ended with that. So why one for a game Amiga Power described thusly? The nearest the software industry has yet come to robbing an elderly deaf woman in a wheelchair whose son has just died in a car accident, returning from the funeral of his father and sister, killed when their ancestral home burned to the ground and then severely beating her with the diseased family pet. But even with Amiga Power's trademark hyperbole, it's undeniable that Rise is craptacular. That up and right method of winning the game in single player is, as far as I can tell, a foolproof way of winning in two player as well. And given that beat em ups are generally bought for two player, that basically removes most of the game from the equation immediately. It's also short. There are only six opponents, and the fact you fight five of them twice in some difficulty levels doesn't cover up that fact at all, especially as it uses the same cinematic intro for each of them both times, implying that Cotton isn't so much tracking down the supervisor as just getting lost. Again, this would be okay if the two-player mode was up to snuff, but even if you ignore that player one can win every time by using this one simple trick, the character count is even tinier there, since player one is always cotton and there's only a choice of five for player two. There's not even a huge amount of variety. There's a couple of special moves for each robot, but they're not grey and a cow to pull off, so you don't and immediately just fly and kick things to death again. We can't ignore the price either. The CD32 version is at least a 5 or 0 for the odds for a CD32 game already, and other than eliminating those disc swaps it doesn't really offer anything the standard version doesn't. The intro doesn't appear to actually be any higher quality even, borne out by the fact that the space Rise takes on its CD isn't much more than 13 discs worth, probably the space taken up by some between level animations the A1200 is missing. And it's not like you're going to watch that intro more than once, especially with that teeth grinding text beeping. It's skippable on the CD32, and if you start the Amiga game from disc 1, rather than disc A, not even joking by the way, then the intro is skipped entirely anyway. But a CD32 game with, theoretically, a soundtrack from Brian May doesn't even use any CD audio is laughable, and that you're paying an extra £9 to watch a 2 minute intro once ever with a bunch of disc swapping on an A1200 is almost insulting. 
The reviews do all universally praise the graphics, but unfortunately for us, they've aged badly. In the same way as early cartoony games have aged much better than those that attempt to do realistic 3D, Rise's character models no longer work. Their smoothness is no longer noteworthy, their resolution terrible, and their lighting near non-existent. They also don't look like they're in the stage. The whole thing gives the impression of low-budget green screening. And of course that's because they're not. There's no 3D here, no world. They really are just fixed aspect models in front of a bitmap. Worse, while the game's good points have aged into irrelevance, the compromises made to achieve them have not. The backgrounds don't move in any sense of the word. There's none of the animation in the background that goes so far towards breathing life into a Street Fighter 2 world, for example. And also the stages don't scroll, making for a very narrow fighting area. This is also what causes this to have more discs than characters. Street Fighter 2 on the Amiga, itself not exactly a triumph, comes on four discs, but it has more characters and stages. So what happened? Unfortunately I've been able to locate the full text of the Amiga Action Review, so their precise reasoning is lost to time for now. Amiga Power, however, noted that they were provided the review copy a mere two days before the game went on sale, which obviously meant that by the time the review was actually published, the game had been on sale for a month. Amiga Action, conversely, had reviewed the game in an issue published much earlier, presumably indicating they'd been granted a much more advanced copy. The same is true of CD Gamer, whose review we do have. They predictably praise the graphics, but actually give the game itself a bit of a kicking, saying, as a beat-em-up, Rise of the Robots is good and certainly demanding, but it's doubtful how many people would rave over its slow tactical control system without the graphics, before giving it 90% anyway. The cynical would suggest that's a man writing a review who has already been given the score and is now trying to write as honest a review as possible without giving the game away. And further evidence for this is to be found on AP2, a retrospective site about Amiga Power magazine written by those that were there. They point out there was a massive marketing campaign behind the game, with magazines being granted interviews, diaries and making of features for up to a year beforehand thanks to the game's delays. They also point out none of those magazines were Amiga Power. And such information as we have confirms that. Action, for example, did a massive preview of the game across two issues. CD Gamer spent three pages on the thing, and that's just straight previews rather than the other stuff Amiga Magazine Rack doesn't index. AP2 also contains a letter from long-term Amiga Power staffer Stuart Campbell, who wasn't with the magazine at the time. In it, he reports talking to an unnamed reviewer who'd given it a high score, strongly implied to be Amiga Actions, and had been told, arms were twisted. It's not conclusive, especially as Campbell has at times been known to forego fact for hyperbole when required to make a point, but it matches the other evidence we found. We'll never know for sure, but there are some facts. Firstly, Rise is a bad game. Even if you somehow don't notice its game-breaking flaws, the game they're breaking is, at the absolute best, unspectacular. Secondly, it's certainly the magazines that got the most love from the publisher that appear to have been given it in time to print a review before release, and those reviews either could have been written without playing the thing, or had a tone that didn't match their score. Money and influence may or may not have changed hands, but then as much as now, Amiga Power were right. Several others wrote reviews that stray way beyond personal opinion and into what appears to be outright lying or misdirection. Regardless of the reason, that fact remains. Rise is barely worth 5%, especially at, on A1200 at least, a price that would have bought you any two of 1994's other good full price releases if you shopped around. Rise was converted to just about everything because Misery loves company. Over the year after the Amiga versions, we saw it on Mega Drive, Super NES, PC, Panasonic Shiny New 3DO, the Philips CDI, and most optimistically of all, the Sega Game Gear. There was even an arcade game. Because if you're a terrible game even compared to body blows on the Amiga, what you really need to do is take on Tekken and Virtua Fighter. Incidentally, most of the ports for Rise of the Robots were farmed out to others, and that was to their benefit. The SNES version, for example, uses multiple buttons, speeds up the intros, has music during the fights, and, most notably of all, actually allows characters to jump over each other and end up facing the other way. It's still not good. It's slow, clunky, and the robots only have a couple of uninteresting special moves each still, for instance. It is, however, a competent, if uninteresting, fighting game. 
with unfortunately literally no reason to exist on a system with great versions of both Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat. Which might make you think the 3DO version could be okay, given that the machine was closer to the PlayStation than the SNES in capability. But somehow that version has all the flaws of the Amiga one, including the lack of music and the inability to jump over people. By this point I'd more than had enough, which is why this is Vise the Determined's footage. Go visit them if you like your Japanese games. We were however curious about the Game Gear version, so we played that one, and it does about as well as you'd expect for a game that trades on its graphics. That said, given that it has music during fights and can't be won by spamming one move, you could argue it's a better game than the Amiga versions. Whatever the reason for the suspicious reviews, they worked. Rise sold very well, and a sequel was commissioned, and Rise 2 Resurrection was released the next year. And since we're here, let's take a quick look. Somehow this is even lazier. There's no intro at all this time, despite being released entirely on CD-based systems. This is the PlayStation version, and at least that's CD audio. I think. It's recorded using a built-in laptop mic at the bottom of the ocean, but I think it's at least CD quality laptop mic at the bottom of the ocean. The option screen loads? This had better be spect- oh. Also, difficulty 12. That that's superb. Those top three are P's apparently, for punch, not F's, for funch. And look, there's the CD music option. In other bonuses, you can now choose your robot, the story being that despite all the holding up and right you were doing, the supervisor defeated Cotton in the last game. Incidentally, if you leave this screen for about the time it took to type that last sentence, it selects your robot and starts the game anyway. Which at least leaves you free in order to watch whatever the hell the AI thinks it's doing here. Also, is it me or does this somehow look worse than the first game? The backgrounds aren't better, but somehow the robots don't look as good, like they had to throw them together a lot more cheaply and couldn't spend the rendering time. Also, quite a lot of the combinations are really difficult to see against the background. For illustration, here's some direct competition, Tekken 2. The people who made Rise thought you would take a look at this, look at Rise 2, and pick Rise 2. Of course, the people who made this game also thought that 30 seconds of low resolution Brian May digitisation is what kids were looking for five years after Queen's last credible album. I think you've detected this is not a better game than Rise 1, in slightly fixed SNES form anyway. And the magazines agreed. Next Generation, the PlayStation and Saturn magazine, didn't even bother reviewing it until their end of year roundup, and then gave both versions 1 out of 5. IGN, normally a fairly generous site, went with 2 out of 10, saying basically that they thought Rise was the worst beat-em-up they'd ever played, until they played 2. Case closed on that one then. And this time the public agreed. Rise 2 didn't sell and essentially resulted in a mercy killing for developers Mirage, which is probably for the best because we do not need to see what a Rise 3 would have looked like. And that's about all of that anyone can stand. If you wish to send your condolences, suggest a worse or better robot fighting game, or just share your best one must fall builds, then the contact details are sneakily encoded into the image on the screen now. There's more specials and extras to come before Season 2, so do subscribe and click the bell to hear when. And if you haven't seen Season 1, Rise has nothing on Gallipoli on the Spectrum. In the meantime, thanks for watching, and remember, if the robots invade, simply jump foot first at them until they go away. Alt F4.